intelligent, which they generally are, it's because we're not marrying cousins. We're not marrying our sisters. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? People go out, they meet someone strange, different culture, different religion, different race, and they marry, and they usually produce a viable offspring that's more viable than either of the two partners. That's what hybrid vigor means in a human being or in another situation. But the Muslim culture, according to studies, still practices inbreeding. Now, I want to backtrack for a minute, talking about immigration. And then you ask yourself, well, should anyone be allowed into a country? Of course. What country says anyone is welcome except an insane nation? You have to have some sort of selection process, don't you, or not? Every sane nation on earth does have a sane immigration policy, except this one. We used to have a sane immigration policy until that drunk bum from Massachusetts, that stumble bum drunk Kennedy, tricked America with the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965. And when it was being discussed, that stumble bum drunk had the nerve to say it will not affect the demographics of America. Well, we know what to expect from a drunk psychotic like someone from the Kennedy family. Take a look at America today. Take a look at what it's become from this, from this massive influx. No selection whatsoever. How many we need? Do we need any? What kind do we need? Should we uh, have some kind of litmus test for immigrants? These are important questions. Now, I, in my book, Government Zero, called for no immigration for seven years, period. A blanket ban. All immigrants, seven years. I don't care where they're from. We don't need immigrants. The country is sinking. We have a very high unemployment rate. We do not need any more immigrants in the workforce. What we need to do is train the unemployed to work in the workforce. That's number one. And number two, and it's a very delicate subject, and I'm warming up to it very slowly because it's something new to talk radio. We're going to talk about Muslim inbreeding, especially in the third world. It's a very important topic. We're also going to talk about Islamic terrorism and why it doesn't exist in Japan. Now, the reason Islamic terrorism doesn't exist in Japan is very simple. Do you know why? Why is it one of the most developed nations on earth has almost no te terrorism? It's a democratic society. Is Japan a racist society, Hillary? Is Japan a racist society, Hillary? They're not affected by ISIS. There was not a single terrorist attack perpetrated by Muslims in Japan. There was not a single minor riot, disturbance, or protest about cartoons about the Prophet Muhammad in Japan. How did that happen? How come Japan has no terrorism? Think about it. They have one of the most advanced societies on earth. They have one of the most advanced technological societies on earth. And um, it seems they don't have too many mosques. They don't have any mosques. They don't have any too many Islamic schools. They haven't banned pork in public places. They haven't banned churches in Japan. They haven't introduced separate hours for boys and girls in swimming pools in Japan. In Japan, Japanese male doctors are actually allowed to touch their female patients. How is that possible? Did you know that in Japan, Muslim women do not get immense social aid each time they bear a child? Did you know that there are no Sharia courts in Japan? Did you know the Quran is not considered a holy book in Japan? So the reason Japan has no problems with terror is that Japan is fundamentally closed to Muslims. Now, officially, Japan is not closed to Muslims. However, the number of immigration permits, Hillary, given to the applicants from Islamic countries is near zero. If you want to get a working visa and you're a Muslim, even if you are a doctor or an engineer or a manager sent by foreign companies that are working in Japan, well, maybe you'll get a permit, but it's very hard. There are very few Muslims in Japan. Very, very few. One of the leaders of the Muslim community in Japan, Nur ad-Din Mori, was asked, what percentage of Japan's total population are Muslims? He said, well, the answer at the moment is one out of 100,000 person who did this article, Y.K. Cherson for Prison Planet, said that Japan's population is 130 million people. So if these Muslim leaders are correct, he writes, then they must be around 1,300 Muslims. 1,300 Muslims. But even those Muslims who obtained immigration permits and lived for many years in Japan have a very, very low chance of becoming Japanese citizens. 
Did you know that Japan officially forbids exhorting people to adopt the religion of Islam? Did you know that any Muslim who actively encourages conversion to Islam is seen as proselytizing to a foreign and undesirable culture? Did you know that any promoter, uh, active promoter of Islam faces deportation, even a jail sentence in Japan? Did you know that, unlike in New York City, Bill de Blasio, the Arabic language is very rarely taught in, a, in academic uh, uh, institutes in Japan. I guess the Japanese are now going to be on the no-fly list. I guess all Japanese will now be banned from entering England. Did you know that importing the Quran in Arabic is practically impossible? And the only Quran permitted is the adapted version in Japanese, where there is no calling for killing and head-cutting. Exactly what I told you needs to be done in this country. How do you bring in a book that says kill the infidel? How do you let it, how does a nation permit that? A book that teaches sub-morons to kill the infidel, and you wonder why some of the sub-morons who have interbred kill the infidel, and cut off heads, and blow up children's centers. Where are they getting this insanity from? In Japan, only two mosques in Japan. Tokyo, Jama Mashid, and Kobe Mosque. The total number of Muslim praying sites in Japan, 30 single-story mosques. A hundred apartment rooms set aside for prayers. Japanese society expects Muslims to pray at home. No laying down in the street, taking over public squares. Take over the public squares to pray to Allah. Can't happen in Japan. If they try it in Japan, they're, high, they're highly fined. They can deport them. Take a look at what's going on in London. That just had a couple of hundred thousand fanatical liber laborites like Hillary Clinton and Muslims wanting Donald Trump banned from England. England's finished. Did you know that Japanese companies seeking foreign workers specifically say they do not want Muslims? Did you know there's not even a trace of Sharia law in Japan? Did you know halal food is almost impossible to find in Japan? You want me to go on? I can go on. You can go on. You can read it for yourself. Read it for yourself. Why there is almost no Islamic terrorism in Japan. The reason is, is there's no Islamic immigration into Japan. That's number one. There's no catering to Muslims. That's number two. That's why Japan will survive. Number three. Be right back. Savage. <laughs> Do you see what I see? I talked about inbreeding, land. and I talked about the dangers of immigrants who have been brought up in families that have inbred for, for generations. I gave examples. I told you what it means for the short and long term of any society that does not discriminate as to which immigrants, immigrants they want to bring in. You have to discriminate. Don't you discriminate every day of your life? Listen to me, you good liberals out there who think that I'm such a Neanderthal. You discriminate every day of your life, don't you? Who you have lunch with, who you have dinner with. What about the condo you live in or the co-op? Aren't you discriminating against and for certain people? The country clubs you join? Of course, you're a very, very discriminating person. You choose who you will talk with and who you won't, who you'll be seen with, who you won't, where you'll eat, where you won't eat, where you'll sleep, where you won't sleep. And don't Mr. and Mrs. Obama discriminate? as to the school they send their lovely daughters to? Of course they do. Didn't they go to a very expensive private school? Why didn't they send their children to an inner city school? They're very discriminative people. They know where the children have a better chance of getting a better education. And isn't one of the lovely daughters right now interviewing colleges? Isn't she discriminating? She doesn't want to go to Trenton State. Would Malia uh, Obama want to go to Trenton State? No. She wants to go to either Harvard, Princeton, Yale. Isn't she discriminating? So, in other words, everybody discriminates, except Obama when it comes to immigrants. And so what I'm saying is we need to be choosy as to who we let into the country. I say let nobody in for seven years till we can sort out who's already here. But that's a whole separate story. We're talking about the dangers of inbreeding. I'm trying to argue that we should eliminate first cousin marriage, make it illegal in all states. Right now it's illegal in only some states. It's very simple. I'm calling for a policy position. There are state laws regarding marriages between first cousins of anybody. Forget Muslims for a minute. They're not the be-all and end-all of the world. You could be a nothing, a, a zero religion. First cousin marriage is prohibited in certain states. Unfortunately, it's allowed in other states under very, very strict 
restrictions. In Arizona, you can marry a birth a first cousin if both are over 65 and one or both are unable to reproduce. Now, why do you suppose that is? Because everyone knows that if you marry a cousin, the chances of such inbreeding are going to produce defective children. Illinois, you can marry a first cousin if both are 50 or older and one is unable to reproduce. Indiana, if both are at least 65. In Utah, if both are 65 or older, or if both are over 55, and one is unable to reproduce. So why do you suppose states limit first cousin marriage? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Except North Carolina, by the way, which is, can become a joke, can become a laugh line. In North Carolina, first cousin marriage is legal. 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 We're not talking about religion now. We're talking about genetics. Genetics. You need to have a, a minimal education to even discuss genetics. Well, I would say seventh grade uh, minimum to even know what the word genetics mean. Put religion aside. Why do you suppose there are inherent prohibitions against first cousin marriages in so many places in America? Because we know that it produces defective children, and it's not a good thing to do for the child or the society. And the good news is that most Muslims in America who have been here do not practice first cousin marriage. Now, all you pseudo-historians are probably uncomfortable with what I've just said, but the fact of the matter is, everything is a fact, or I wouldn't have said it. Savage. You get the picture, right? A, Jimi Hendrix was 50 years ahead of his time. B, this is America today. A discordant star-spangled banner, because we have a retrovirus in the White House. Welcome to the Savage Nation program. It's going to be a special program, which I'm not going to introduce right now. You just know it's going to be unique, and we'll get to it as we get to it. But being an artist rather than just a reader of uh, websites, I want to go back in time with you for a minute. And I want to tell you that, you know, we keep hearing the 60s were bad, the hippie movement destroyed America. But I want to say to you that the 60s weren't all bad. You see, I was watching home movies from the 1960s. I finally collected all of my 8mm. Anyone out there know what I'm talking about? 8mm, super 8mm home movies. I've had them collected in a couple of boxes for years, hundreds of them, hundreds of them, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. From the years that I was in New York, young teacher, young social worker, leaving for Hawaii as a young graduate student. I was supposed to only go there for a year to, to earn a master's degree and come back and then teach in some upstate New York high school collect rocks and, and drop dead at 50 from boredom. But uh, as life had it, some things happened along the way on the road that sent me in other directions. And as I was watching these 60s home movies, seeing my, my little dog Woody, who uh, was killed in front of my eyes in Queens and Forest Hills when I, <laughs> he was, uh, we were, I was walking him and uh, uh, Dalmatian was released off a leash, ran across the street, bit Woody right around the back, crushed his rib cage, punctured his lungs. I couldn't even reach down and stop it. All I had was a dead animal in my hand, so I rushed him uh, in the little Volkswagen. I had some pictures of my little green Volkswagen Beetle. Rushed over the bridge with my friend, got to a veterinarian hospital, and uh, they pronounced the dog dead and gave me a bill for $75. I was very young. I had almost no money. I was so outraged. Why would they charge me when the dog was dead, I thought. Anyway, so I saw the Woody. I saw the car. I saw the this. I saw the that. And as watching these movies from the 60s, I saw my father. All of the characters from those of you who've come to love my books, such as, uh, I don't remember the title, Psychological Nudity, uh, Train Tracks, all those stories of my childhood. I can't believe it when you look at your father, your mother, your aunts, your uncles, and their friends, and you yourself in your 20s, and they're all dead. And what it does to your brain, you start thinking in a different way, you know what I'm saying? Memories are one thing, movies are quite another. So I'm watching these movies because I finally collected all of my home movies, hundreds and hundreds of them. It, take, it took me years to finally find the person who I trusted to put them all together. And I got ten discs back two hours before the show. Ten discs or seven discs of, like, basically my life. I'm creating this little thing for the, for the family, the children, whatever I'm going to do with it. I don't know yet. And I started to think about this. very important you listen to me if you're a follower of the show because this is very political. I saw myself as a very straight, young social worker, teacher, and then suddenly the movie jumps to 1968, and I have a beard. I have long hair. I look like Charles Manson. And the last scene of the movie is me as a free spirit on the roof of a hospital in Hawaii, a research hospital. I was working in as a grad student, 
moving freely on this roof with the horizon behind me and the ocean behind me. 